All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our PropTech with NAR meetup series. Uh, my name is David Conroy, and I'm one of the directors of Emerging Technology here at the National Association of Realtors. Uh, my colleague, Dan Weissman, and I, we started these virtual meetup series during the pandemic, and it's great to see how these have, have grown over the years. Uh, I think today we had a record number of registrations so far, so that's fantastic. Uh, also really excited to just kick things off here for our first meetup of 2022. So today, as, as you've probably seen, we're going to begin with a presentation on recent M&A activity, followed immediately by an expert panel who will be providing us an investment forecast for the following year. Another reason why I'm excited for today is that our, our little meetup series now has a presenting sponsor. That's Estate. This sponsorship, believe it or not, came up mostly organically. Uh, it was late last year, and I was looking at what domains were available with the dot real estate domain, and I was shocked to see how many great ones were available. I was actually able to get Dave dot real estate. Sorry, Dave, I was able to get Dave dot real estate, uh, but I paid full price for mine, and you you don't have to. So you can use promo code twenty off tech, and you'll be able to get twenty percent off your domain registration on us because we really appreciate you being a part of this community. Uh, don't worry about scrambling for your phone right now. I'll drop this promo code in the chat here as soon as we get kicked off. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guest. So uh, as I mentioned, Chris Goff will be kicking us off here in a moment with a presentation on recent M&A activity in PropTech. Uh, immediately following his presentation, he will then join us in a panel that's going to be moderated by uh, Aaron M. Malarkey, co-founder of Remarkably. Uh, along with Chris and Aaron, we'll also have Kevin Crosby of Carta, which if you aren't familiar with, is just a fantastic equity and ownership management software. Uh, and we will also be joined with the always fantastic Dave Garland, managing partner of Second Century Ventures. Selfishly, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So Chris, would you just like to kick us off? Great. Uh, appreciate that. Appreciate the introduction and nice to be on this call here. I'm going to share my screen in, in a minute here. And uh, we can talk through what's happening in both the M&A and growth capital landscape within the real estate technology sector. But just to back up for a moment, my name is Chris Goff. I'm a managing director at a global investment bank called Houlihan Loki. I previously spent 18 years at a firm called GCA, where I ran the prop tech coverage effort and investment banking effort on behalf of GCA. GCA was actually just purchased by Houlihan Loki ourselves. So we were the subject of an M&A transaction. The deal closed in December 2021. And I'm now tasked with continuing to build out the advisory practice within the property technology ecosystem at Houlihan. I'm very excited about that opportunity. We've been a, a very active advisor uh, in the prop tech market. We've done about 40 transactions globally over the past five years. Uh, we provide growth capital and M&A advisory services to companies across the property technology ecosystem. And we also publish a quarterly report that's widely read as a source of data and benchmark analysis for companies in the property technology universe. So I'm sharing my screen now. Um, if uh, can you can you all see that before I before I kick off? Yeah, we got you. Great. Uh, so for 2021, I mean this this chart really is a summation of such uh, such strength that we've seen across the entirety of the prop tech market. Almost 19 billion dollars of gross capital went into the market in 2021, up over 2x from 2020. Part of that was just some latent demand that was backed up as a result of COVID and hitting deals in 2021 as opposed to 2020. But a lot of that reflects the continued adoption of technology really across all categories within the property technology ecosystem, especially now as we're seeing increasing convergence between the worlds of financial technology or fintech and property tech as these new innovative products, particularly those that are designed to serve the consumer around the financing or refinancing or transaction activity associated with the residential real estate purchase are becoming more and more prevalent. So um, not just iBuyers that we all know about, but also power buyers, uh, alternative financing products like Figure uh, and others have really grown in the space and, and been causing a lot of innovation across the market. Another category that was significant in terms of capital into the market in 2021 was the commercial sector. and We expect to continue to see increasing activity around the commercial real estate sector moving forward into 2022 and beyond. The commercial is such a broad category of asset classes. There's industrial, there's multifamily, there's 
multi-tenant office and all of those asset classes have multiple constituents, tenants, property managers, owner operators, uh, maintenance and service providers into those ecosystems. And so there's a whole host of technology that's been growing and scaling around not just the tenant experience in each of those categories, but also kind of the operator, the operator workflow and a suite of tools like building engines, for example, that are designed to enhance the owner operator productivity across those uh, environments as well. So um, as we look at 2021, the other thing we saw was uh, an increase in the number of sizable growth capital raises. So growth capital raises north of $20 million that came into the, to the market. So as you see in 2020, 59 deals north of $20 million in the US uh, and in 2021, 2.6X uh, up almost 150 plus deals uh, north of $20 million that came into the US prop tech ecosystem. So to us, that reflects the continued maturation of the market, the continued uh, desire for investors to see scale solutions that are growing nationally across the market. And as you see on the right, a number of those larger transactions were multi hundred million dollar financing. So hundred million dollar plus financings that came into the ecosystem in 2021. You know, within the residential sector, I'd say we've identified three key themes uh, that are impacting both the growth capital environment and the M&A environment. On the software side, there's a set of consolidators that are increasingly driving M&A activity across the residential real estate software ecosystem. And these are primarily productivity tools that sell into the broker team and agent ecosystem that are designed to create that complete lead to close solution for the real estate agent ecosystem. So Lone Wolf made several acquisitions in 2021, property base, uh, Teradata, LionDesk and others. Um, Zillow Group acquired a software platform called Showing Time to enhance the um, access control and, and, uh, and uh, uh, scheduling solutions to the residential real estate ecosystem. You've also seen companies like Inside Real Estate recently take on a new investor, GenStar Capital, to help beef up their M&A activities in the market. And so these software solutions that are selling into the broker team and agent ecosystem, in our view, will continue to drive uh, roll-up activity in the software market and residential real estate. You've also seen the growth of these brokerage as a service players. So Place Inside is an example of players who are delivering more than just technology to their team and broker partners. They're delivering ERP and accounting solutions. They're delivering recruiting and retention solutions. They're really trying to help enhance and take some of that, that sort of infrastructure um, burden off of their agent and team partners and broker partners uh, by providing them with more than just those technology solutions and driving a lot of growth in both those businesses, Place raised a $100 million plus round in 2021 at close to a, a north of actually a billion dollar valuation. Uh, and it continues to see strong momentum in its business. And then, as I mentioned, the expansion of the power, power buyer universe. So these are companies that are attacking the residential real estate market from both um, the, the real estate side as well as the financial side. So they're using these alternative financing products and consumer enablement products to help facilitate transactions. We've seen a, a number of companies across this space have different distribution strategies, some going through brokerages, some going direct to agents and building their, uh, 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 some building a direct to consumer brand, all trying to attack a similar consumer problem around removing friction from the financing, financing aspect of the real estate transaction. Uh, within the commercial space, as I mentioned, we, we expect to continue to see increasing activity in this category. So CRE workplace operations tools, JLL bought a, a business called Building Engines, HQOI Office um, are, are major players in that category. Again, around all aspects of that sort of tenant experience inside of the CRE building and return to work environment is really driving enhanced activity and interest in this market. Within multifamily, um, you're seeing a similar tenant focused suite of tools but around the amenification of the experience for the tenants within multifamily. So that includes community engagement solutions, front desk registration tools uh, like Butterfly MX, um, 
tools that are enabling inter internet across uh, you know, multifamily environments, companies like Plume and others. Uh, and then there's a big piece of the tenant experience that involves rent collection. So integrated rent collection, integrated payments processing into these technology and software platforms like what RealPage, Yardi, Entrada and others are providing is a key theme that we're seeing across the multifamily space. And then another category that we're watching closely and it's gained momentum in 2021 that we expect to continue to see develop in 2022 is the construction technology market. This is a, by some estimates, a 10 plus billion, excuse, uh, yes, 10 plus billion dollar TAM opportunity in the construction technology market where there really are um, a number of smaller solution providers uh, that, are, that are increasingly looking to scale and drive efficiency in the, con in the construction ERP category in particular. Uh, one of the themes that we've seen is the development of, of a high profile prop tech investor. So within multiple large scale funds, there are teams now that are increasingly focused on the prop tech markets and groups of individual investors who have formed theses in the space that, that are looking to deploy capital against prop tech businesses. We've all heard of the fifth walls and the Andreessen's and the Coastal is being highly active, but across a much broader swath of the institutional capital market, there are prop tech focused teams who are looking to deploy capital in the space. We're also seeing the rise of the strategic investor in the prop tech market. So whether it's AmFam on the insurance side or First American on the, the title side who are, who are both strategic players operationally as part of their core business, but also are deploying in more of a venture capital or growth equity oriented way, capital into the space to help fuel prop tech innovation. Uh, and so you see a number of the large strategic growth investors who've made um, bets in 2021, and we expect to continue to see this list grow looking into 2022. Another really interesting uh, development over the last 18 to 24 months has been the increasing globalization of the market. So obviously there have been um, prop tech innovators across multiple different geographies for years and years now, but I think increasingly we're seeing U.S. capital providers look internationally to replicate some of the more successful business models that have developed in the U.S. in international markets. And we're also seeing international capital providers fund prop tech as a specific category in some of these international geographies, uh, just given the success of what we've seen here in the U.S. in terms of the growth of the ecosystem and the, the amount of value that's, uh, that's embedded within the prop tech universe. So I think as we continue to develop our research in the space, we'll increasingly focus on some of the international names that have uh, received significant funding in the market over the past few months. Uh, unicorn club. So we have uh, 12 new prop tech unicorns in 2021. Um, again, a number of different players across different sub segments of the industry but in the residential and mortgage category, you see some of these, um, these power buyer slash alternative financing oriented players like uh, Figure, uh, Homelight to a degree, um, as well as some other brokers and service models like Place and Side, uh, and then some folks who are handling kind of the downstream aspects of the real estate transaction like Qualia and SnapDocs. So again, the, the number of unicorns and the growth of these businesses cuts across a, a wide swath of the prop tech ecosystem. I would say on, on this page, you know, this is a, a little bit of an eye chart for those of you looking over Zoom, but this just to me reflects the number of companies that have received funding in the space north of $25 million. So 219 companies have raised north of $25 million in the US prop tech ecosystem. This is a US focused chart. And so again, as, as you think about the number of companies driving innovation across all of these segments, um, there's, there's a whole swath of different players across different subcategories that are attracting investor attention. Now, the one thing this does raise, the question this does raise, I'm sure for many of you, is who becomes the buyers of these business ultimately? How do, how do you sort of find a path to liquidity for many of these businesses? And actually, if you look at the upper right-hand part of the page here, the IPO SPAC deals of, since 2020 uh, and 2021, you see a number of companies have found a path to liquidity via the public markets. And although some of the SPAC transactions that have gone through the de-SPACing process 
have been challenged from a price perspective in the markets as of late over the last six or so months. You know, many of them are trading down. They still do have significant capital balances. And so you look, for example, at somebody like Porch, who's done a number of uh, M&A transactions since they went through their SPAC process. Uh, as an example of a business that's used m a as a tool to continue to grow post IPO or SPAC, you know, Procore has been active on the m a front as well, for example. And so I think as you look at this ecosystem, we're, we won't just rely on those IPO SPAC market participants for liquidity, but they are um, going to be, and we expect them to continue to be future buyers of businesses uh, down the road, just given that's typically the mandate in a SPAC transaction is to use some of the capital raised to continue to go out and acquire other businesses. So then I'll skip through the, the rest of the, this is all available, by the way, on, on my LinkedIn profile or on hulahamloki.com. But the last slide I would just point to is the significant uptick in M&A activity that we've seen in 2021 as well, 162 M&A transactions. And I would say this is one of the, the first times we've seen um, a little bit of a broadening of the scope of the participants in the M&A process, meaning some non-traditional prop tech players like Hilti, like Insinko, have entered the market um, in a more meaningful way and have done M&A in the space to, to buy into the prop tech market. And we expect to continue to see that uh, as we move forward down the path here, just given the importance of prop tech as a category within the broader fintech um, arena, and just given the size of the real estate asset class. So global payments, another good example of somebody who uh, historically hadn't been thought of as a prop tech acquirer, bought Zigo Paylease uh, er earlier in 2021 uh, to get into the multifamily rent collection category. Uh, and so we expect to continue to see the number of uh, acquirers in the prop tech market grow, obviously with traditional acquirers like Zillow and, um, and, and uh, Lone Wolf and JLL on the list as well going forward too. Um, I'd, I'd say the last sort of piece of this in terms of the M&A appetite that we're seeing is the private equity universe continues to be active for scale platforms. So Stonepoint and Insight acquiring CoreLogic uh, Toma Bravo acquiring RealPage and then using RealPage as a vehicle for continued M&A. Um, and and uh, Entrada uh, obviously taking capital, not being acquired, but taking capital uh, from Silver Lake earlier this year. And so there are a number of large scale funds on the private equity side that uh, are increasingly looking for vehicles in the prop tech space as platforms to then go out and roll up uh, other smaller players. Lone Wolf is another perfect example in the residential category owned by Stone Point Capital. So maybe with that, I'll pause. I know we've got more on the agenda, but I'll stop the share. I'll turn it back over to our moderators and we can get into the panel Q&A because I think a lot of it relates to the activity that we've seen in the space here. Awesome. Um, thanks, Chris. It's super interesting and, and exciting to know that we can just go go grab that PDF because I'm sure everyone's probably trying to screenshot various parts and pieces of it that are relevant. So you just made that a lot easier for, for everybody. Um, so obviously there's there's sort of a huge range of the acquisition there. There are there's the Unicorn Club um, all the way down to you know kind of never disclosed numbers. Maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of the range of different categories of acquisition types and sort of the typical multiples that groups can expect to see as they move through kind of the maybe aqua hire all the way through up to kind of IPO, you're buying revenues and customer. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's such an interesting question. It's a question we get asked a lot. Um, and I'm going to go back to, if you don't mind, another slide, just because I think it's um, relevant to the question, which is the distribution of multiples across different categories within the prop tech ecosystem. And so I think it's important to um, sort of frame the question around the business model as well. So I think there's a couple different factors that influence valuation. One is just the total addressable market opportunity. Are you tacking a big, a big total addressable market opportunity? Are you tacking a small total addressable market opportunity? Uh, the second is how are you monetizing? Subscription revenue, SaaS-based revenue, tends to be higher valued revenue and profit relative to transactional oriented revenue. 
Uh, and so the, both the visibility into go forward revenue streams is a big part of that, but also in, in SaaS businesses and typical software SaaS businesses, the gross margin associated with that revenue stream is rel relatively high. So you have a lot of operating leverage uh, that you can generate as a result of selling that high gross margin subscription revenue kind of in the cloud and pushing it out to hundreds or thousands of different users. So as we look at this uh, chart here, these are enterprise value to 2022 revenue and 2022 EBITDA multiples. You see on the left-hand side of the page, the highest revenue multiple categories are the portals, data businesses, and the real estate data and software categories. The lowest category of revenue and actually also um, EBITDA multiples uh, are the more transactional brokerage-based uh, business models where, again, you've got a lower gross margin against that type of offering, and you have um, a little bit more of a transactional revenue stream that's subject to cycles in the real estate industry. It doesn't mean that those companies are inherently bad. In fact, many of those companies are very, um, very strong, um, you know, great businesses, I would say. Uh, but it just means that the marketplace is different uh, values against them. I'd say the other thing that determines the outcome from an M&A perspective in the PropTech universe is scale. Um, so many companies that are, call it sub 15 in, in ARR if you're a software business um, or a little bit larger if you're a transactional revenue business, you just get a discount applied to the business as a result of people feeling like there's some scale risk associated with the company. So the larger the business is, once you sort of tip over that threshold of 15 million in NARR on the software side, you start to expand a broader universe of investors who look at that more as a platform business as opposed to a point solution. And then the last factor I would say is growth. Um, and growth is such a huge driver. We've been in a, in a market over the last six or so years where growth has been the primary driver of valuation for many of these uh, SaaS businesses. I, I think we're starting to increasingly see a little bit more uh, of a focus on both growth and not necessarily absolute profitability, but kind of what the path to profitability looks like for many of these businesses, because um, I'm sure the venture guys on the phone will tell you that they don't want to fund a business into perpetuity. Uh, and so there's an increasing focus, especially in these choppier markets around sort of understanding how much capital is actually required to kind of tip over that, um, that, that profitability threshold. And then, and then sort of as a subcomponent of that, a lot of focus on the unit economics. So what's your customer acquisition cost? What's the lifetime value of a customer? That ties into retention rate. And so that's another key piece of understanding how, how willing people are to fund that growth if there's a burn. Yeah. So that was a long answer. Um, I, I don't know if Kevin or Dave have anything to add there, but uh, that, that'd be how I would answer it. Perfect. And yeah, Kevin or Dave, anything from you guys you wanna to add to that? Um, so, so Chris, we talk, we talk a lot about the success stories, but I know part of what everyone was excited about and in chatting with people before this, this meetup was, okay, let's have a real conversation, right? Like, let's get down and dirty on what happens behind closed doors. Um, so you talk a lot about success stories here. What are the top three reasons acquisitions fall apart? Where, where do they go south? It's, you know, it looks like it's heading this way. People are planning their, their vacation or their yacht or whatever's going to happen. Where does it, where does it fall apart? Yeah, I'd say if, if I had to pick three, three reasons, I'd say number one is just performance of the target or in some instances, the acquirer, right? So in the middle of a process, we always say, really make sure you've got that 95% plus confidence level in hitting the projections that you're putting forward in the middle of these conversations where someone can, can't look at you and say, hey, look, you know, you said you were going to do X in revenue, you did you know, 80% of that, we're gonna to have to take a haircut to valuation. That's oftentimes the cause of breakage in later stage transaction conversations. Um, the, the second is around the technology and, and sort of the technology stack and scalability oftentimes. And so, you know, people as part of due diligence processes, buyers do oftentimes bring in third party technology uh, consultants to do an audit on the technology solution that they're buying. And sometimes they find uh, things that they don't like. That could be the way in which the solution's architected and how it fits into their existing solution. It could be 
the use of third party source code that wasn't, um, you know, sort of owned by the by the company that, that had developed it. And so they have some sort of third party code licensing issue that exists. Um, it could be the, the way in which the go forward technology roadmap integrates with their go forward technology roadmap. And so I'd say there's a whole host of issues that can come up around um, technology that can cause people to just say, again, not that the company is bad inherently that they're buying, but just that it may not be a fit for them um, as, as an organization and how they think about the business strategically. And then the last I would say is a management team. And you know, a lot of people give lip service to uh, management team being so important, but the reality is it, it is. People say it because it's true and the cultural fit between organizations and the way in which employees are gonna integrate with one another and who's gonna be leading up different divisions within the company is a critical piece of the recipe for success within M&A. And so making sure that um, there's alignment around roles and responsibilities, but also comfort in particular on the buyer side that they're going to be buying a team that can help deliver against the results that are being promised by the seller is, is critical. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm seeing we already have a bunch of questions in the chat, which is great. We'll keep keep those coming. Um, we've got the last 15 minutes for audience Q&A and I think um, we'll use every minute of it, but I'd love to, to shift gears now over to kind of from a macro perspective, what's happening in PropTech today. So, so Kevin, we're gonna turn it over to you. We'd love to begin sort of 30,000 foot view as it relates to what areas and segments are you know are we seeing innovation in prop tech, and then we'll turn it over to Dave Garland to dig in a little bit deeper about you know where where is this innovation coming from? Sure, thank you. Uh, so things that I find kind of interesting in the prop tech space, specifically around going deeper in the data layer and being able to uh, kind of quantify what's happening in properties specifically. If you took the consumer landscape, you know, we started with smart home and kind of putting in the traditional products being connected to Wi-Fi, but now you're going deeper into specific sensors of leak detection, glass detection, uh, smoke, and things like that, that actually provide a little bit more spe specificity around what's happening in the property. Uh, that's actually also enabling a lot of the opportunities around automation, how to make your home more proactive versus reactive uh, to the things that are going on in your home and more responsive to making it a better uh, experience for you. Um, and then more even broadly up beyond that, I think about it in terms of what does that mean for asset utilization, making sure that you're actually getting the biggest value out of the, for, for consumers specifically, the property that they own um, and, and being able to use that as a way to be more efficient or more space uh, utilization. Um, and then when that actually connects into your service provider layers as well, uh, that becomes very interesting as well. So if people can uh, plug into a layer where they're detecting issues, they can connect it to their insurance providers or security uh, or even other um, you know, detections for, for home automation as well. So those are areas on the consumer side. In the commercial side, I think you see it a lot from end-to-end -end processes of, of um, productivity improvements within workflows for CRM of individual agents, listing providers, lenders, uh, from tracking and managing lead gen all the way out to loan originations and kind of management of the financings. Um, I've been super interested in kind of the, the future of what uh, that may lead to in terms of um, you know, uh, what I would consider, whether it's blockchain web three, all the way out to just smarter identification of people's um, security, making it privacy preserving and more efficient as well. So um, those are some of the areas that I've been super focused on uh, and, and where that lends to in terms of opportunities for, for entrepreneurs is really getting down to um, pain points that are still unaddressable or unsolved yet and going deeper into what that they can build in terms of the data layer or getting it uh, more efficient into the process layer and integrated into service providers. Great, okay, awesome. So, so we'll turn it over to, to Dave Gardland now. Dave, you obviously see probably more deals than, than just about anybody in terms of um, you know, where, where are PropTech startups coming from? What are they tackling? Um, how is that changing what, what the venture community looks like today? We'd love to hear your, your thoughts on just you know, the landscape overall, where the people are coming from and what that means for, for the space itself. Yeah, all wonderful questions, Erna. And I think before I get into that, just a brief background of who I am. I'm, I'm the managing partner of 
Second Century Ventures and NAR Reach alongside uh, two other partners, Tyler Thompson and Mark Birschbach, where we are the uh, venture capital arm of the National Association of Realtors. And really why we exist is to invest in technologies that serve to keep the practitioner central to the transaction for the benefit of the consumer. So you're right, we do see a lot of technologies uh, domestically, globally, and my personal background is that as a practitioner in the real estate ecosystem, uh, on both the commercial and residential side, as well as a founder of uh, technology uh, companies that serve the space. And really, my passion is to you know, continue to help the plight of many of these entrepreneurs that are serving the space and to eventually get to the point where they can communicate with people like Chris and work on uh, substantive exits uh, for for their own venture. And I think that, you know, to to answer your question, yeah, you know, there has been a explosion of prop tech companies that are uh, that are impacting the real estate ecosystem. We are undoubtedly experiencing a renaissance in real estate technology across all sectors and not just residential, but commercial in leasing construction the impact of sustainability and fintech and housing affordability and livability have really come front and center and in propelling entrepreneurs to come up with creative innovations that solve some of the biggest problems in real estate. And these companies are coming from all around the world because opportunities in real estate are somewhat universal in scope. And problems that these companies have been tackling have generally been associated with the digitization of analog activities. And the pandemic itself forced investors in tech businesses to accelerate that transition in a number of respects and answer, answer questions of what a really new normal would look like. For instance, the digitization of in-person activities uh, has gotten a lot of investment uh, attention, like property tours and property management and notarization and appraisal. All these things have taken have had to take place digitally and virtually across all, across all asset classes. And those services are underpinned by a lot of subservices that are dependent on data and analytics, et cetera. So the impact on the VC community because of these new demands has been really incredible because capital tends to chase opportunities and inefficiencies. Couple that against a backdrop of record low interest rates in addition to massive amounts of liquidity that this market has never seen. And the net net of that has been venture deal sizes have been increasing capital has been deployed at historic rates. And this in turn continues to inspire more entrepreneurs and more innovation and more creative thinking about age old problems in the space. Again, that transition from analog to digital has inspired a new wave of thinking about the ecosystem that has created this renaissance. Yeah. So, so what's next, right? So, so you talk about, right, this focus on the digitization of analog activities. What in your mind are still the big opportunities to be addressed? Where's, where's the money going to be going kind of crystal ball uh, in, in the future here? Uh, the, uh, the age old question of where's the money going in the future? Uh, you know, generally speaking, the biggest opportunities that still need to be addressed have historically been where the biggest markets are. And the biggest market in real estate tends to be surrounding the transaction itself. And this concept of the transaction impacting place. Now, place is a huge concept. The importance of place has never been more important than today, where we live, where we work, where we shop, et cetera. And you know, if we just take one segment within the industry itself, like residential, we're seeing the pace of the transfer of place at historic levels in terms of pricing of housing in the US. You had 6.1 million homes transferring hands last year at prices that were roughly 20% higher than they were the year previous. The US housing stock right now is worth over $40 trillion, which is over two times where we were prior to the downturn of the Great Recession. So we've had massive amounts of appreciation against a backdrop of all of the things that make the transaction work itself. So 
all of those transactional items amount to an incredibly sizable addressable market. Now, what do I mean by addressable market? I mean the amount of capital that surrounds things like commission dollars. So we're looking at $100 billion a year in real estate commissions and referral fees just in the residential space alone, and $30 billion being spent by practitioners across for sale advertising and rental advertising. On the lending side of the transaction, you've got over $60 billion a year spent on mortgage origination and post-transaction, the subsequent transaction of renting uh, like billions of dollars associated with renting and property management services that take place. And, and then the things that make the transaction gel, the title insurance, the escrow and closing services account for over $70 billion a year. So when we talk about where the next opportunities will be in the real estate ecosystem, it will largely be surrounding the transaction itself and finding ways to make that transaction more efficient for consumers, better, quicker, faster, and how to better deploy that capital that is being spent by traditional practitioners in such a way that it enables them to get a larger yield on their actual services that they provide. Professor Kevin, do you guys want to add anything, anything to that in terms of um, kind of consistent themes you're seeing there or, or any deviation from that? The, the one thing that I would add, um, both on the consumer side specifically, I think the transition to uh, the digitalization of finding uh, man purchasing and also kind of like closing on deals is actually like one of the things I've seen accelerating specifically. Uh, and I think, you know, those problems will continue to be a high friction area. It's not going to go away. Um, the, the challenges around that, if you think about uh, going into the financial side of security, uh, prevention and privacy, I, I think is really interesting as well, where, um, you know, the the, the fraud created on those transactions becomes so important that you actually have to keep going down and inventing in that, that the identif identity verification or like transaction verification. So I, I would echo that as well. And to the point on like big TAM opportunities, like that's where venture dollars will continue to go. The biggest ROI and IRR are gonna be on those types of deals. So I uh, would encourage founders to kind of continue to see like the small areas of innovation but that can grow into those large TAM opportunities. Great. Okay, awesome. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time because I know we, like I said, we've already got a bunch of uh, questions in the chat. So we're going to shift gears to the third section of today, which is fundraising real talk. Again, all the questions people want to ask, but but don't always get the chance to. Um, so we had some questions that folks have submitted in advance. Um, and then and then again, we'll, we'll open it up to all of you. So so Kevin, since you've got the mic, let's let's start there with you. Um, which is, you know, what what have you seen crypto companies do to be able to successfully raise funds? What, what are sort of the... Uh, some of the best best in class practices. Uh, I tend to bucket best in class in a couple different functions. One being able to identify the problem and being very specific on what problem you're trying to solve for. Generally, that lends itself to a beachhead that allows to adjacent opportunities that their product can scale into. So it's really seeking out like, is this pain point interesting? Is it going to be uh, solvable through the product that you're offering? And does it scale into opportunities where if you build this, then you can do why? Um, the second thing that I, I think a lot about is management and are they actually fit to deliver this, this um, solution and for this problem. Often, you know, I find founders that are uh, either experienced entrepreneurs or have the technical chops to, that have done it. Uh, I think uh, Chris had mentioned this with management teams specifically, like you really want to have the deep technical expertise to build the solutions within that space. So that's probably the second one. Can you build the right team? Uh, and then the third one is really your time horizon. Why this? Why now? Uh, I think a lot of times it's easy to say this is an interesting problem, but if it's not at the right stage uh, for a founder to raise capital or even demonstrate traction, they're probably not going to have as much success in delivering that results. Um, and, and, you know, adjacent to all of that is being able to find the right investors that'll match your time horizons as well. And so you might be able to find uh, your problem may be longer lead, but if you're looking at short-term investors that maybe have a, a smaller capital allocation or a smaller time horizon on their fund, they may not be able to match what you need in, in the time period to deliver those results. Great. Okay, thank you. And and Dave, how, how about you? If we go kind of behind behind the scenes at SCV, um, 
you know, when, when groups are choosing to invest in a startup, most VCs have some sort of framework that they use for evaluating opportunities. Um, as you're able and willing to share and as brutally honest as you can stand to be, uh, what, is, what is SCV's framework? Yeah, our framework is relatively simple. I mean, we are a positive sum strategic investor where we look to create more value than just the dollars that we would put into a company. Now, what does that mean? It means bringing the value of our network to bear on the investments that we make to help companies uh, better face the challenges of you know, a demanding audience. You know, and and uh, we, we're here to serve the practitioners and the constituents within the ecosystem. We see ourselves as stewards of the ecosystem looking to invest in the technologies that will underpin not just what's happening in the next two to five years in the ecosystem, but what's really gonna happen in the next hundred years. Uh, hence the name Second Century Ventures. We're, we're trying to invest in technologies that will serve place for the next century and beyond. So the question that we always ask is, can we add value above and beyond the dollars that we put in? And in addition to some of the things that Kevin mentioned as well, I mean, we're looking at you know, the vision of founders. We're looking at the capital that they've raised and the traction that they've been able to achieve to date. And also we're looking at the people, uh, the people that are, you know, uh, assuming control and responsibility for driving growth within an organization. Uh, the vision capital people side is really essential. It's, it's kind of the underpinnings of any good investment. And I think that uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a VC out there that doesn't look at those three categories as prima facie, the key uh, reasons to, to invest if, if they're doing well. But we also try to look out for superpowers in the space. And uh, this space is really uh, determined by you know how how well companies are able to achieve product market fit. Uh, their channel market fit and strategies are extremely important in this fragmented environment and the defensibility of a product or service. So, you know, whatever superpower a company may have or an entrepreneur may have, we really try to dive in deep and, and figure out whether or not that superpower is, uh, is defensible. Perfect. Okay. And, and obviously, Dave, for, for a group to be in a place where they're being evaluated as it relates to your framework, they've, they've got to get on your radar, they've got to get on your list. Um, I know from some of your fellow portfolio companies, I've heard some really amazing stories, literally including people flying around the world to bump into people in, in hotel lobbies, you know, in, in Beijing, whatever it is. Um, what have been sort of the, some of the most effective ways that, that groups can get on your radar and then, and then least effective? You know, I think that uh, really, we're looking to talk to companies at the earliest stages, and we have uh, some pretty interesting programs that are custom made in order to reach out and have those conversations with these new founders. Uh, we've introduced Reach Labs last year, which is a collaboration with uh, associations and MLSs that enables uh, those particular parties to get to know entrepreneurs at the local level, all the way up to our traditional REACH programs that are essentially there to provide exposure to companies that have proven a product market fit. So in terms of reaching out to us, uh, please feel free to leverage our channels on LinkedIn, our websites at uh, narreach.com, scv.vc, et cetera. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or any of our, our team members. Uh, we wanna hear from any entrepreneurs in the space that have a technology that uh, seeks to enhance uh, the, the plight of the practitioners, that, he, that seeks to make the transaction better, more efficient, and uh, we're, we're interested in hearing your ideas and, and, and learning more about how together we can you know, make this ecosystem a better place to, uh, to work in. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move it over to, we, we've got a bunch more that um, we could keep covering. We're gonna move it over to the audience section here. Um, and just, just while we're talking about this, Chris, let's start, start with you in terms of you know, either thoughts or data you have on the number of prop tech funds in the market and, and returns from those respective groups, even, even though uh, potentially early in their overall lifespan. Yeah, and unfortunately I don't have any data on returns for any of the groups. Um, so I'm not really positioned to comment on that, but I, I do think, you know, so there's, there's two different categories of prop tech funds. There's the dedicated funds, the Camber Creeks, the Fifth Walls, the, the Meta Props, Second Century, et cetera. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are groups within larger funds who are focused on the property technology category. It doesn't mean it's their exclusive focus, but it's a category 
that they're active in, interested in, and are deploying capital in. So you think about somebody like TA Associates with their MRI investment, or you think about StonePoint with CoreLogic and Lone Wolf, or you think about Level Minic Partners, uh, which is a sort of a fin financial technology oriented fund that owns Atom Data, they own Inside Real Estate, they own Universal Credit. And so um, I, I think it's important, you know, obviously, the, the prop tech focused funds that we kind of read about and hear about get a lot of attention in the market. But I think for people looking to raise capital, it's important to understand that there are a much broader swath of funds who are great investors, who have diversified backgrounds across a whole host of different fintech or software oriented businesses that are very interested in this category. Great. Okay, perfect. And and so related to that, what, what are your thoughts on um, kind of any of these potential MLSs, Chris, emerging as sort of active technology aggregators? What are your thoughts there? Well, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, from, from a strategic perspective for the MLSs and for the agent uh, ecosystem, it makes a lot of sense for MLSs to want to control the destiny around technology solutions that they deploy across their agent base, as well as share in some of the upside associated with the, the benefits of growing and building a big technology organization. So we saw some forward uh, thinking MLSs with FMLS in Austin and Miami and a couple others uh, acquire a business that we sold called Remind Technologies in 2021. And, and that was, um, and I apologize if I'm missing any, so somebody may call me out here, but that was really one of the first major forays of MLSs uh, in the tech M&A arena in a meaningful way, owning and deploying a solution across their member base. Um, you know, I, I, I think some of the questions that people ask about MLSs owning uh, and developing technology is, are these folks really going to be the sort of back to this kind of uh, technology development leadership per question that we talked about or topic that we talked about earlier, are these the right folks to grow and build a technology organization and kind of own and develop the, the, the development side of what it means to grow a tech business. And um, I think it, it gets back to, can you get a management team in there that can help come alongside these MLSs to give them the technology chops to be able to grow and scale a big tech business? I see no reason why it's not possible. Um, and we have seen some evidence that they are going to be more active, uh, but it's been pretty limited to date. Okay. So, so this next question from Andrew, I think it actually would be a good one to do sort of maybe a, a quick round robin, the sort of 60 second answer from each of you, because I think it obviously it, it spans each of your respective categories. Um, I think this is one probably that's top of mind for a lot of folks, which is, you know, when you look at that, that pyramid of logos, you know, is it, is it that race to really having that consistent year over year growth? Or is it that, that race to, to a nice exit? Um, and, you know, Obviously, there's just been a tremendous amount of, of MA activity. Um, looks like there's no sign of that slowing in the near future. Would love, you know, what what you could, from each of your kind of different purviews, um, what your thoughts are on, you know, what what are we really indexing for here? Chris, you want to start us off? Sure, we'll sure. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. I mean, I, I don't think there's a single singular strategy, meaning. And I hate to I hate to kind of dodge the question a little bit, but there are players in the space who have what what I think of as kind of momentum capital raise strategies, where they're raising larger slugs of capital in kind of twenty, fifty, a hundred million dollar chunks because they want to go after significant categories in the market. Avant Stay is a good example; just raised a, a massive round to attack this kind of secondary home vacation rental management category in, in kind of an owned and operated manner. And, and that market, I mean, it's not quite a limitless pool of capital that can go into that market, but it, you know, within the sphere of the total addressable market for what they're attacking, um, you know, it's a large raise, but it's, I wouldn't call it kind of too much capital. There's plenty that they can deploy against that asset class and do fantastically well. For somebody who's developing a, um, you know, a, a feature within a, a, a process workflow, uh, within the real estate transaction process, for example, somebody doing a transaction management system or a CMA tool, or maybe a, a website marketing solution. I, I think you need to be a little bit more measured in the way in which you think about your capital raises and your go-to-market and the timing of those raises. And you can build 
great businesses both ways. So I don't think it's a one size fits all, but you don't want to over raise relative to your TAM or under raise relative to the size of the opportunity and how fast you want to grow. So that's where I think companies get the most um, kind of trouble, so to speak, is where they, they've got a mismatch around their raise um, goals and, and outcomes relative to what they're trying to go out and execute against in the market. Great. Okay. I, I would echo that as well. I think especially at the early stage, like pre-B, you're really kind of struggling to find the balance of how much capital do you raise before you start investing heavily into the business, uh, especially if you think about enterprise where you're thinking enterprise sales, marketing, uh, your go-to-market strategy versus just getting the right product market fit. Um, I do think there is some risk to back to Chris's point of, you know, the, the bifurcation of very large rounds to drive acceleration and kind of adoption in those categories. You really have to think about how big that opportunity really is relative to what you can do in a given time period. Um, so a $200 million round or a hundred million dollar round, uh, you're, you're really going to be saying you're, you're, TAM is addressable. You have really defined go-to-market strategy. You know the repeatable mechanisms to grow, uh, but you're not in the, the early stage where you're still trying to figure that out. So I, I think it is a, a bimodal kind of distribution of the uh, capital out there. Steve, how about you? You know, the status of the market has a big impact on how one would answer the question. I think that over the last couple of years, uh, we've become accustomed to uh, valuations that we may not have seen years previous in technology companies. And uh, this swath of available capital that has been available like never before has inspired entrepreneurs to say, well, I better take it while the going's good because I don't know when this spigot of capital is uh, going to gonna dry up. And oftentimes that plays on the motivations of many entrepreneurs while, while raising. And I think that the period of instant capital from venture or high net worths uh, may be lowering in terms of volume in the short to medium term. I think that we're already starting to see signs of pullback in terms of valuation expectations and multiples on trailing 12 month revenues for SaaS companies, uh, unlike we had seen in the last 12 months. So uh, it's not that the party is over, it's just that the, uh, the music's slowing down and, and it's time to get to work. And I think that part of the, you know, the broad answer to that question gets back to, well, what, you know, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Do you wanna be a dividend company? Are you looking for an exit? And if the question, if the answer to the question is the latter, then that's oftentimes market dependent on what's available and whether there is a eager opportunity by market acquirers and or public market that uh, would be entertaining of exits. I think that we saw a short term blip in SPAC activity uh, that we don't really see in today's market like we saw 12 to 18 months ago. And the question of, well, OK, what are some probable exit scenarios are largely dependent on the underlying theme and need of, uh, of, of the entrepreneur themselves. And I think that uh, one of the points that, that, uh, that Chris made had to do with you know, what we're seeing like in the, in the single family rent growth place or, or SFR space where a lot of these companies are raising to actually hold on to assets and not necessarily sell their enterprises. And we've seen a tremendous amount of capital enter that particular space uh, in the last year and a half. I mean, looking I think it was in 2020, we only saw $3 billion that was really laser focused on funding uh, new capital announcements for SFR. And, and last year we saw close to $50 billion. And, and these are companies that nobody talks about in the press. I mean, everybody wants to talk about the open doors of the world and the Zillows of the world, but uh, you know, we, we rarely see headlines on, on firms like Graystar or Predium or Electra. And, and those are the firms that you know, they're slowly but surely acquiring thousands of single family homes a month not for the purpose of necessarily selling their enterprise, but for the purpose of holding and extracting dividends off of their assets. Yeah. So let's let's stay on this theme of, of the global stage for a minute. And, and Dave, since you've got the proverbial mic, we'll, we'll have you kick this off, which is, um, I think, a great, a great question from Natalie and, and frankly, perfect for you to answer as it relates to sort of the, um, the kind of international continuing expansion of, of the REACH Accelerator, which is you know, Natalie's question was, you know, we've looked a lot about prop tech and investments outside of the U.S. Um, as well as, you know, um, kind of what's going on in the States and would love to hear kind of thoughts on, you know, do you see more investment flowing into prop tech companies 
outside of the U.S., or do you see more globalization of U.S. prop tech companies? And, and would love your thoughts, um, Dave, particularly through the lens of, of the Reach Accelerator and sort of the continuing globalization of it. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah, good. I was going to say. I was going to say, keep it short and sweet. <laughs> no, there, look, there, there's a lot, lot to unpack there. I'd say, just broadly speaking, uh, you know, valuations outside the U.S. Uh, are dissimilar, oftentimes, to what we see in the states. And there's some very unique opportunities. And in some circumstances, technology uh, is is more advanced, or uh, markets are more advanced in certain uh, segments than they than they are here. Take Australia, for instance. They've been uh, many years ahead in terms of some of the property management technologies that we're that we're now starting to see larger investment checks being written uh, to, to those same types of companies here in the U.S. Uh, but you know, does that normalize over time? I, you know, uh, broadly speaking, I don't know. Certainly, you know, capital is finding a, a path to the best opportunities, and I think that from our perspective. Uh, you know, the best technology doesn't care about borders. And we use two broad lenses when we're evaluating investments. And that is, you know, A, can that technology span across segments? Because if you're building technology that's specific to a unique segment, sometimes it's very difficult to get scale enough to attract some of the larger and later stage investors for larger exits. So can you span across segments? And then secondly, can you span across geographies? And in order to do that, you know, it gets back to the entire question of TAM and is the TAM large enough to justify a investment in a, sp a specific uh, realm and is the problem big enough and universal enough to solve and, and frankly those are the most interesting to solve and those are the ones that get get attention attraction investment and uh, but on the other side of the coin gets gets the most competition yep 100 percent okay um, I know we have just just one or two minutes left here. Chris, Kevin, anything either of you want to add add to that? No, I, I mean I would just say to to add on to Dave's comments. I mean, we see for companies looking to move internationally, part of the opportunity and barrier can be regulatory within the real estate space, and so. You know, whether you're talking about a construction ERP solution that is designed to solve the regulatory permit uh, issues that are germane to a certain geography or, or an LOS that sort of attacks the market in a specific geographically oriented way, just given the regulatory complexity of some of those markets, that can be a barrier to international growth. You know, conversely, we just sold a business or Helped the business called Star Res take a majority equity investment from Vista Equity Partners. They were Australian based with the substantial majority of their revenue outside of the US. It was a student housing and multifamily oriented software solution for property managers. And there were no regulatory barriers there that prevented them from growing internationally. And so some of these workflow tools that to Dave's point kind of are designed to solve a process problem. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can be used internationally have tons of capabilities to continue to grow. Yeah. Well, David, I think, um, thank you, uh, Chris, thanks for your thoughts on that. And, and David, I think you've got uh, clearly a, another meetup to be had here since uh, there's, there's a bunch more questions we didn't even get to cover in the chat as well as a bunch more that came in before today's conversation. But um, I'll, I'll turn it back to you just for wrap up in our last minute or two here. Thank you, Erna. Um, yeah, that was fantastic. I was really, really blown away by all the engagement in the, in the chat. Uh, I'd like to close this out here today with just a quick reminder for everyone to make sure you head over to meetup.com forward slash prop tech to make sure you're signed up to get notifications about future events. And once again, I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to our speakers today, Chris, Aaron, I did, Kevin, you all did a fantastic job. I personally learned so much. Uh, if you want to stay connected and want to keep this conversation going, I've added contact information to the chat. And uh, if you'd like to share this, this content today from today's meeting, it'll be available on ner.realtor forward slash tech starting tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks all. Thanks, Dave. Thanks all. Thanks, thanks Aaron. Bye-bye.